Hello and welcome to Shots Fired, leading through an active shooter situation. My name is Brian Strauser. I'm principal and CEO here at Bright Path. We're based in the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul as a consulting firm specializing in crisis management, business continuity, crisis communications, and global risk. During this webinar, we're going to talk about corporate leadership through an active shooter situation. Uh, for a little bit of background uh, in myself, I spent 21 years at Target Corporation uh, entirely within the global and corporate security function. Uh, the last six years of my time there, I was Target's head of global crisis management, business continuity, and global intelligence. Uh, for the, since 2014, I've been founder, principal, and CEO at BrightPath, uh, where we do consulting work on active shooter planning and preparedness and other related areas of crisis management, business continuity, and crisis communications. And I've led through a number of active shooter situations. The one that I will refer to a few times throughout this webinar is a situation that happened in 2012 at one of Target's corporate headquarters locations in downtown Minneapolis, uh, what was previously known as the Retech Building at the intersection of 10th and Nicollet Mall, where there was an active shooter uh, situation that turned out to be a false alarm, but not after a six hour long lockdown and SWAT team mobilization and search of the entire building. Um, in this situation, I think we were fortunate in that it turned out to be a false alarm. Construction noise was misinterpreted as uh, gunfire leading to multiple 911 calls and an ongoing situation uh, that went on for several hours. In addition to this, I had a number of situations where we had actress shooter uh, situations in retail stores throughout the United States, including some where employees of the organization were killed and we had to work through that situation with the local team and law enforcement and do the right things so um, as i talk about experiences and things we've learned it's not just from uh, the theoretical what if this thing happens um, i have led through these situations as a corporate security leader on multiple occasions our agenda for this webinar will be to talk about mitigation and preparedness strategies for workplace violence and active shooter situations, about crisis leadership during an active shooter situation, uh, recovery strategies to help your employees recover from a workplace violence or active shooter incident, and then also how to communicate and make decisions during a crisis. All of these are important to understand how to act as a leader and be able to move your team through the steps necessary to respond to an active shooter situation. As we talk through these, uh, as we talk through these strategies, there's a number of you know, kind of refer to this timeline of events that I think are important, and that is we think about an individual exhibiting normal day-to-day -day behavior, and then they begin exhibiting pre-attack indicators. So these are things they're doing that individuals might find suspicious, or threatening, or weird, or just downright strange. Um, that are happening and sometimes we don't think of them as pre-attack indicators until after the attack has happened but we can see in many times you know and we're seeing it right now uh, with some of the recent uh, mass shooting incidents that have occurred we learn a few days later about police reports and police contacts and strange behavior um, strange comments or threats the individual made that perhaps weren't acted upon uh, so these are the pre-attack indicators that we're concerned with and we'll talk more about that in a moment then there's the attack, there's the, the boom, the thing that happens, the after shooter incident where um, this attack has occurred in there and you'll, you're likely to have injuries and fatalities and now you've gotta go through the immediate response and then you shift to long-term recovery which can go on for, for months or years or even decades. So this is the timeline as we talk about what these incidents look like, this timeline will become important. Let's begin with a little bit around preparedness and mitigation. And for us, this starts by having a solid threat management process in place in the organization. And this is our threat management framework that we kind of start with here at Bright Path. Um, so going from left to right, uh, we have the threat incident. We've got the comment, the suspicious or strange comments that have been reported by the individual, you know, by someone who sees the individual, witnesses the individual exhibit this, or perhaps they're phoning it in. They're making you quite aware of the threat. Our approach is that the local leadership at the site, 
uh, triage this using risk factors and categorization, which we'll talk about in a moment. And really one of two things. It's either a high risk threat or an emergency, like an imminent situation, in which case we're gonna contact law enforcement or emergency services immediately. We're gonna make the 911 call. We're gonna report the violent threat because that threat is imminent or it's high risk. Or it's a, there is no threat, it's an unwarranted uh, comment or it's a low risk threat, in which case we're gonna move this into monitoring, which could the monitoring could go on for weeks and months. And then everything else is going to get shifted into the threat management team process. You can also have threats that you've judged as unwarranted or low risk and you're in monitoring stage and you realize that, well, actually they've exhibited other behavior and now because of that, I think if this is a medium or moderate risk threat, well, I'm going to kick that out of this monitoring bucket to the threat management team or threat assessment team to take a look at this. Then we get into the cycle on the right, and that is we're going to investigate, we're going to try to understand and assess, we're going to gather the facts, we're going to assess the validity of the threat, we're going to determine what kind of mitigation strategies we need to put into place, and then we're going to shift into monitoring. And as we said, monitoring could go on for weeks or months. And then something could happen that escalated, and then we're back in the cycle again. So we kind of keep moving through that cycle. In a lot of cases, monitoring never really ends. Because even a low-risk threat is something you're going to want to revisit from time to time to see is it really still a threat that you need to be paying attention to or not. And you'll find that threats that you've dismissed previously come back as big threats. So that's the framework. Here we have a list of pre-attack indicators or risk indicators. And I won't go through and read all of these. Um, we've categorized these as, as kind of suicidal, uh, domestic violence, employee on employee or student on student, and threats made from an outside subject. It's important to point out that the mere presence of one of these things here doesn't mean that the person is about to commit an attack. You have to look at these risk factors uh, holistically, and you're really looking for the presence of multiple risk factors that raises the risk, the, the likelihood of an attack that could happen. For example, um, lots of folks own weapons, own firearms, um, and we recognize that as a constitutional right in the United States. So the mere possession or ownership of a firearm doesn't make that person a risk. But they're, if they have a history of violence and they have a hostile attitude and they're abusing uh, some type of, uh, of um, prohibited uh, substance like marijuana or heroin and they have access to firearms, well, now you've got four or five risk factors. Well, that's a lot more likely that something's going to happen. It's a lot more riskier of a situation. There's more pre-attack indicators present. So we think about some you know, basic mitigation preparedness. And the first one is we need to be able to train we need to train the team at our sites to be able to take the actions that we want when an active shooter situation happens. And I, I think that we a lot of companies will overcomplicate this. We like to just keep this simple. It's as simple as call 911, give the 911 operator the key information, the pertinent physical description and what they're doing and then follow the process that the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security have been teaching. And that is, if you can escape, run. If you can't escape, hide. If you can't hide, fight. Run, hide, fight. And you can go into more detail about what these mean, but I wouldn't change the language. I wouldn't deviate from this approach. It's if you can escape, then get out, so run. If you can't escape, find a place to hide. If you can't hide from the attacker, then fight or distract in order to get back to hide or run. I wouldn't get more complicated than this with your frontline employees. There is a ton of information available on the FBI's website and on the Department of Homeland Security's website uh, and probably at your, in your local emergency management or uh, uh, state police uh, website on run, hide, fight as a strategy and training material that you can use. But in our mind, mitigation procedures and preparedness procedures are fairly worthless if they're not paired with exercises and drills that you need to be able to practice these things. And the things that we recommend that you practice for active shooter are first sheltering in place. Think of this as the hiding stage. But if you got a lockdown, how do you do that? And, and what, what, are the, what are the processes that you want people to follow? If you need to evacuate the building, if you got to run, what does that look like? And where are the rally points or assembly points? 
And keep in mind that you may need multiple assembly points because your primary assembly point could be blocked or it could be too close to the building as to be safe. So you need to have some alternatives available. Two other types of exercises that are more complicated is to do a tabletop on the active shooter uh, plan and incident with your crisis team or your leadership team at your location. And then lastly, you could do a full-blown simulation with law enforcement. I've run these. They take months of planning to do, but they're a fascinating response uh, in that you're actually simulating what the law enforcement response, fire EMS response would look like. As you plan exercises, do not, please do not do this in a way that traumatizes your employees. You know, even just this last week, I saw news articles about police firing blanks and using uh, airsoft guns to shoot people, causing pain. Uh, I've seen, um, you know, fake blood and stuff uh, used with the general employee base or students. I, I do not think that helps us at all. You need to teach the basics and then have folks exercise to the basics. If you decide to do a simulation with law enforcement, I would encourage you to do this off hours uh, with volunteers. You'll get plenty of volunteers. Um, when the last one I managed was conducted on a Saturday morning. The corporate headquarters location was closed. We had warned employees this exercise was going to happen. We had 40 or 50 volunteers participating. Um, and so it was done in a safe and controlled manner where you weren't traumatizing employees for what I think is a marginal gain uh, in exercise effectiveness. So shelter in place, building evacuation, tabletop with your crisis team, and simulation with law enforcement is kind of your four exercise or drill categories to consider. I want to shift now and talk a little bit about public-private partnerships. I think it's important, as uh, particularly if you're a large employer or if you're a large complex building or campus, or university, it's important to work with law enforcement and bring them into your planning. Uh, the United States Northern Command has a challenge coin they give out from their interagency cooperation group. Um, and the outside of the challenge coin says, when you need a friend, it's too late to make one. And it's entirely true when it comes to this. If you do not have a relationship with your law enforcement agency and you haven't talked about active shooter planning uh, and response and you're creating an active shooter plan, then I think you've failed as a part of your planning because when these guys show up from the local SWAT team and they're responding to that active shooter incident, they are not interested in building a relationship with you, right? They're not there to build a relationship with you. They're responding to a, a potentially lethal, violent incident in your workplace. So build those relationships up front. Have those conversations early on. Uh, and bring them into your planning so that you understand what they're going to do. They understand what you're going to do. And you have a way of communicating throughout the incident that happens. In terms of additional mitigation preparedness steps, then we start talking about reacting to the threat. And think about your, your site uh, where this might be happening. Um, we go from normal operating procedures. And so what, what's that look like in terms of physical security? We decide there's an escalated threat. What changes in the security posture or the physical security of that location? If we have to shift the lockdown, what are those steps? And what does that look like? And then if the incident actually occurs, there is an active shooter, uh, active assailant situation, then we respond and we execute our plan for active shooter. But what does that look like? So those are things that need to be planned out and thought through in advance so that when the time comes, you've practiced it, you have good muscle memory, you're going to react and take those things on. Let's talk about some examples of where things go wrong. Um, in June 2017, a UPS driver, Jimmy Lamb, uh, shot and killed three other UPS drivers in his place of work. After the incident, there were three risk factors that were noticed and communicated in the news coverage. And that is uh, Mr. Lamb had perceived disrespect from coworkers. He was possibly in a depressive state. And he had filed a grievance recently about excess overtime that he was being punished for. So some of these actions, there were some risk factors present. This grievance may have been the triggering act. It's, it's really unsure. But this is a good example of a, a relatively typical uh, fatal workplace violence actor shooter situation. Another example from here in the Twin Cities in September 2012, 
at Accent Signage, uh, Andrew John Engeldinger was told that he was being terminated, that he would be losing his job. And he responded with, oh, really? And then opened fire and killed several employees, including the owner. Several risk factors here. The first that he had a pretty negative family support network, so there, there, was, there was no grounding or no connections for him. Uh, his family reported uh, potential paranoia and delusions in his mental state. Um, he had uh, really poor work performance. He had known access to firearms, a known history of violence, and known grievance towards his supervisor. So there were a number of risk factors present. If we go back to our chart, there are a number of risk factors present in this situation that could have indicated you know, a higher risk situation than normal. So when we talk about high risk termination, what makes the situation high risk? Well, it's situationally dependent. Um, but what makes it high risk is that you have these pre-attack indicators or risk factors that are present in this situation. Therefore, we may want to treat this termination or reduction in force with this individual differently than we might a lower risk termination. Planning for these should really involve a good upfront discussion between the manager for the individual, your human resources or employee relations team or counsel, and your security team or an outside security consultant. Uh, you can use law enforcement if you really have to, but you want to have some planning around how we're going to approach the conversation, what do we think is going to be the most effective method. You may want to think about how do we, what are some things that we could do to lessen the burden of his termination? Do you extend his health care coverage so he can keep going to his counselor? Uh, do you um, perhaps give him some pay, 30 days pay, 60 days pay? But you, you really want to look at what, what are some things that you can do to lessen the blow uh, and minimize the risk for violence and for acting out during the termination and have a good plan on how you're going to walk uh, him out, him or her out and secure, kind of keep the situation secure. Think about who's going to conduct the conversation. I mean, typically the supervisor has the most connectivity with the employee, so you want them to be the one having this conversation. But if he has, if the individual in question has a grievance with that supervisor, well, maybe we need to use a disinterested party uh, from human resources or another part of the company to do that. I'm generally not a fan of having security in the room, uh, except in really extreme situations, but it depends. Uh, some folks are pretty good at, uh, some security professionals are pretty good at diffusing a situation and have good training on, uh, you know, kind of talking folks down in these situations. And some are somebody that's more aggravating uh, to do that. Or they add aggravation to the situation is what I'm trying to say. Another risk area here is just reductions in force uh, or layoffs. Generally, these don't result in issues, but we do encourage strong cross-functional planning between um, security, human resources, the business lines, and other corporate leaders. The, the two keys to success here is beyond having upfront planning is to make sure that um, you know particular individuals who might have exhibited risk factors, that we've identified those and we've decided are they high risk or not? And if they're high risk, how are we going to address that? How are we going to treat, uh, how are we going to address their particular situation during the RIF? And the other key, key to success here is just make sure folks are treated in an above board and humane manner. Um, it's a business decision uh, to make a reduction in force. It's not personal, or at least we hope it's not personal. Um, but we want to make sure that everyone is treated fairly and humanely and with all the dignity and grace that we can supply uh, when we're taking someone's employment from them. Um, there's no need to be overly brutal about the layoff. And a, a little bit of kindness here really goes a long way in how people feel in the moment uh, and helps reduce the risk for violence. So now that we've talked through mitigation preparedness, let's talk a little bit about actually leading in the critical moment. What do we do in the response when something happens? So first, we encourage you to have some type of protocol or procedure for when an active shooter becomes known at a corporate level. We're beyond now at this point the run-hide fight at the location. They've called 911. They've reported the situation corporately. And so our first three questions quickly are, is this over or is it still ongoing? Uh, you know, is there still a threat? Has law enforcement been notified? And what do we know about what has happened? And then there's a ton of other questions that are also important, 
those are the first three. That's my initial assessment. Um, the the ton of other questions start with, well, where is this occurring? Has law enforcement been notified? Are they on site? Which agency is in charge? Do we have a main contact there? Have employees been notified using an active shooter alert or whatever your process is? Do you have remote employees at the location? Do they know? Are there travelers there? Have they been notified? And you get the idea. It's important to script this out. You want to have this plan out in advance because when you get that phone call, you're not going to remember all of these things that you want to make sure get done. Make a checklist uh, that guides your discussion and conversation. We do have pre-prepared checklists that you can purchase from us as a starting point. You can see those at crisisplaybook.com. And this is the actual active sh- part of the actual active shooter checklist. Now you're in the moment. You've gotten your initial notification. You've asked your assessment questions. We encourage teams to have a physical space where they can manage the situation. It doesn't have to be anything fancier than you've got two adjacent conference rooms or two conference rooms that are near each other. You're going to use one. Uh, for folks to where folks are going to call in it's going to be like your watch floor they're going to call in they're going to give you updates uh, they're going to um, you know keep you updated on what's going on you're going to have a separate room where you're actually going to have your crisis team which we'll talk about in a moment uh, and you're going to be working through the problems generated by the active shooter situation and anyone that's not involved in the process keep them out okay let your crisis team work the situation and keep others out of the way they're not trained other folks are not trained on your crisis process they're not a decision maker in the process keep them out i know it'll irritate them but it's the best thing to keep things running efficiently if your situation is going to go on any length of time order food uh, folks get hungry um, so for some folks they stress eat and that helps keep them calm and that's important during this time i'm a stress eater um, and then Um, depending upon where the situation is, um, deploy somebody to be with the incident commander from law enforcement. If you've got any kind of law enforcement response going on, they've set up some type of incident command post at the site and somebody there is in charge. That's the incident commander. You want to have someone from your company that you can trust go and sit with that individual so that they can be a resource to law enforcement and you can get answers about what's going on. The folks that you want to do this, we would recommend that they go through the free incident command system training or ICS training. You can do it online through FEMA's Emergency Management Institute. That's training.fema.gov or your local state emergency management agency or a county emergency management agency might teach similar course. But then you're speaking the same language as law enforcement and the incident commander. When you activate in this situation, you're getting your crisis team together. Um, If this active shooter incident is anywhere near your headquarters or where your crisis team is, have your crisis team take a moment and call their families and tell them that they're okay. In the target situation in 2012, I was across the street. I literally could go to the window of the conference room in my corporate command center and I could see the police response in the street with our building right there across the way. My parents called me nonstop until I got back to them and told them I was okay. So head that problem off uh, early by having people call their families, tell them they're okay, tell them that they're, they're going to be busy with response, but they're safe. It's okay as you go through this situation to be a bit frazzled. Um, most of you have probably never dealt with anything like this, and it's a very stressful, very challenging situation. It's okay to feel like that. But you do need to be able to box up your emotions and deal with those when the incident is over because your team is going to be looking to you to understand how to act and how to feel and how to lead. Remember as you go through this that idle hands are the devil's work. And what I mean by that is when nothing is happening, give people something to do. You will find as you work through this that um, there will be lulls uh, as the team on at the site It's working through the situation and there's not a lot for your team to do in the interim. Give them something to do. And then lastly, you want to exercise this with your crisis team in a way that reproduces some of the actual stress of the incident so that you can see how they're going to react. Because the reality is some folks are just not meant, uh, don't have the, um, 
the right skills and the emotional intelligence to work in a situation uh, like this where you may have lost employees or customers or others. And that's okay. That's, it's no shame on them. Um, but this isn't for, you know, not everyone is cut out to do this. I want to talk for a moment about just the science behind emotional intelligence and crisis teams because I think it's important. And I'm going to reference work done by Harvard's National Preparedness Leadership Initiative, or NPLI. Um, NPLI is a uh, research and education program at Harvard uh, that is a joint effort between the JFK School of Government and the T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Um, I'm a graduate of their executive education program uh, from cohort eight in 2012. What these guys did, Dr. Lenny Marcus on the left and Dr. Barry Dorn on the right and their team, is they researched leadership in a crisis. And they looked at the psychology of what people go through. Um, but they also went and sat with leaders in these large national scale disasters like Hurricane Katrina, like um, the Deepwater Horizon spill, uh, oil spill situation, and others and really sought to understand what was happening and what kind of decisions were being made. In this process, they talked about this concept of crisis meta leadership and that there were five dimensions to this. There was the person of the meta leader, their strengths, their weaknesses, their understanding of themselves, their ability for self-control and um, for leading themselves through a situation. That strong meta leaders, strong crisis leaders had extraordinary situational awareness. That they understood uh, what they knew, what they didn't know, and what they needed to know to fully contextualize a situation. And they could see both the strategies, I'm sorry, they could see both the tactics that they needed to execute and the overall strategy on a strategic level and what was happening around them that created influence or threats or risks to their current approach. And then that there were three specific types of leadership that a meta leader displayed in a crisis. The first is that they led their silo, the function that they were responsible for in an organization or in a public sector agency, they led that silo well. They also led up. They had strong communication and a trusted relationship with their uh, supervisor or the chain of leaders above them. In a lot of cases, think about a public sector emergency management leader being the head of emergency management for a state, for example. Well, leading up from them is usually the governor or the adjutant general or perhaps a public safety commissioner who may or may not have any experience with emergency management. So they get the professional head talking to the elected official or the appointed official in government. That interface is critical, their ability to lead up. And then lastly, their ability to lead connectivity, their ability to lead across the multiple silos in an organization or across the multiple agencies in state, local, county, and federal government. Those five dimensions combined made for um, a strong crisis meta leader. And the other factor that the two doctors came up with as they looked at, um, at the characteristics of leaders in crisis management was this idea of the basement. The basement being the bottom part of your brain where your fight or flight syndrome sits. And that, they, that strong leaders had the ability to recognize when themselves or someone else was headed to the basement. When they were headed on the stairs, going down to the bottom of the brain, getting to that fight or flight syndrome. And you want to avoid that as a crisis leader because that's where trouble starts. That's where you don't react and you don't lead the way you need to and therefore your team does the same thing. So one of the goals uh, in a crisis is to make sure that you stay out of the basement and that you keep your team out of the basement. Part of that is just making sure people get rest um, and that they have, the, uh, they have the sleep reserves to be able to deal with a stressful situation. And part of it is just being able to recognize and have coping mechanisms for the stress that comes into these situations. And then lastly, there's the, just the whole concept of emotional intelligence. And you get the great book um, from Travis Bradbury and Gene Greaves uh, on what emotional intelligence is and how it works. Uh, the current version is Emotional Intelligence 2.0. But in crisis management on your crisis team, you want people who have a high level of emotional intelligence. They're able to deal with these very difficult situations and deal with them well. 
I want to talk a little bit about having a crisis management framework. This is an important element of leading through an active shooter situation. Um, this is the crisis management framework that we often use with organizations. Uh, on the left, you kind of see the increasing scope and severity of a crisis situation. At the bottom, the various ty types of incidents that feed into a crisis, an operational or business incident, uh, uh, IT systems, reputation, security or financial, and then you may have others for your particular organization. That we have a decision to activate due to a crisis threshold being crossed, a corporate crisis management team that manages the situation. We have a responsible executive that leads it, an incident leader whose job is to coordinate the process. We have support teams that support that crisis management function. And then up above, we have the CEO and executive staff and the board of directors. That could also be your owners in a smaller business or a private equity organization. So the goal here is that as things increase in scope and severity, we're managing them and communicating them differently. That corporate crisis management team should be cross-functional. It's typically made up of teams like corporate security, crisis management, HR, comms, business continuity, facilities, the business lines or operating companies, legal. However it's set up, it's important to define who's running the process and who are the backups to those leaders so that no matter who's out or what's going on, we're clear on who is in charge and what's going to happen. So this is the team that should be really managing your corporate response to an active shooter situation. Let's talk a little bit about long-term recovery. After that situation is over, after you're through the life safety focused response, we move on to long-term recovery. And, and I should point out here, uh, recovery starts really as soon as, as soon as the life-saving response efforts are over. And then we move into recovery. But it's important to point out that long-term recovery could go on for months uh, or years. Um, and some aspects of this will go on for decades for individuals who are more directly involved in violence. One part of long-term recovery is to make sure that you make plans for an after-action process uh, to gauge the performance of your response to the situation. This is an honest self-assessment of what happened, how you and your company responded, and how you wish to improve moving forward. And then you should communicate the results of that after action process and your plans to mitigate your action plan to address the issues that you found. You can, there, you can do an after action process in a lot of different ways. Uh, we like to keep it simple. What worked here that we are proud of? What did we like? And what are those things? What didn't go well here? And what are the things we want to make sure we improve? And then what are the specific action steps that we're going to take? You should prioritize those. You should assign an owner. You should put a time frame on them so that you're going to, you can show how you're go going to take action and you make it real. It may be necessary uh, if your team is impacted to provide um, counseling individually or as a group. You may even need that for your crisis management team. You probably have something available through your employee assistance program or EAP, but there's lots of companies out there that can help with this if, or, or through your healthcare provider, insurance provider. Uh, may be necessary. You may even need this coming out of a particularly traumatic incident. Uh, don't don't hesitate to do that. Um, having been through many of these situations, um, I've I have found it helpful um, to deal with my own emotions going through these situations. Um, but your employees will appreciate it and will most likely need it. And then, lastly, remember that if you've had a violent incident. Um, particularly if there's fatalities or injuries, um, you probably have facilities that need to be repaired. You may need to um, make design changes to that facility in order to improve security. You may need to replace um, drywall and carpet and other material in the building. You may need to completely reconfigure it just for the mental health uh, and well-being of your employees. Don't hesitate to do those things think about how to do them up front as you're coming out of the immediate response mode. But it's important to remember, again, some of your employees, if they've been directly involved in some of this uh, and have been directly impacted, um, they may have um, recovery challenges, post-traumatic stress, and other difficulties for years that 
you will want to play a part in you know, trying to remediate and help them over time. Last big section of our webinar, we want to talk about just communicating in the critical moment, communicating in the crisis. It's important here to think about in a situation like the active shooter situation that you have different audiences that you need to communicate to. And your messaging may vary from audience to audience. The first is your impacted employees, those at the location that were directly impacted. You may have, uh, you may want to send communication to all of your employees. You probably have separate communication for your senior leadership and your board of directors. Those may be separate audiences or might be treated the same. You have stakeholders in the local community like the mayor, city council, uh, police chief and others that you need to communicate with. And then there's the public as a whole who undoubtedly will want to know how you as the organization handled the situation. And so you have to think of them as an audience that you're going to have to communicate with. In the immediate steps of the crisis, if you can send a corporate spokesperson or an executive to the scene to co-locate with law enforcement spokesperson, I would do that. Um, at a minimum, send someone who is a, a communications professional or, or a, a leader with enough skill set in communications that they can hang out with law enforcement's public affairs, uh, public affairs or public information officer, PIO, and be able to coordinate with them so that you're all speaking from the same book, so to speak. Um, as we said, also recommend sending a comms trained corporate executive along with communication staff uh, to help in that situation. Make sure as you're doing any communication that you're doing your internal comms first before you're communicating anything publicly so that your team knows what's going on. And then early on, just establish a cadence of ongoing communications. Maybe that's every 15 minutes. Maybe it's every 30 minutes. Maybe the situation's over and you're in immediate response, so we're going to do more of once an hour. But set the cadence so that folks know what to expect, particularly your, particularly your employees. The key takeaway here and one that a lot of companies struggle with, you need, you need to have communication plans in place. You can fill in the detail in the moment. You can edit it in the moment. But if you don't at least have a template, I think you're going to really struggle to get communications out fast enough for the way the media cycle is right now. You start your comms plan with just a simple holding statement. Just something other than no comment to tell the press when they call. So here's a simple holding statement. Right now, our focus is on our employees, our customers, and all of those that are impacted while law enforcement does their job. We do not have any additional information at this time. Now, this is better than a no comment because a no comment is kind of a push off, like go away. You want to be, you want to give the media something they can use. And this is a great statement. Right now, our focus is on our employees, our customers, and all those that are impacted while law enforcement does their job. We don't have any additional information at this time. What that means is down the road, you're going to communicate more, and they'll understand that for what it is. During the event, once you've coordinated with law enforcement and um, you're able to make more of a statement, then you could say something along these lines. We are concerned about our team, our customers, and all those that are impacted, and we're doing everything we can to ensure their safety and well-being. We can confirm that a 911 call was made from our Texarkana location, and those on the premises have been instructed to take cover and shelter in place. Now, we're not going to show any names here because uh, that's for later communication. Uh, so we the, the line there in the middle. Law enforcement is in our Texarkana location, and we are working closely with them to learn more information. As this is part of an ongoing investigation, additional questions can be directed to law enforcement. We will share more information as soon as we can. So here we're sharing a little bit more. We're reinforcing that we're worried about our team and our customers and those impacted, uh, and we want to ensure their safety and well-being. But because this is an active situation or it's an ongoing investigation, additional questions can be directed to law enforcement. We will share more as soon as we can. So this is kind of your initial statement. When the, safe, when the incident is over, uh, again, coordinating with law enforcement, you could say something like, around 9 p.m. this morning, a 911 call, I'm sorry, around 9 a.m. this morning, a 911 call was made in response to a threat in the building located at 
604 Alphonse Drive in Texarkana, Texas, where approximately 54 of our employees and six contractors work. This has been an unimaginably difficult day for our team. We are all stunned and deeply affected by the loss of our team members and the horrible events that our team and all of those involved have endured. We're committed to supporting our team as we all struggle to understand and cope with this news. We've encouraged employees to do whatever they need to in order to grieve and process this incident. Grief counselors are being provided to support our team. I'll need to refer any questions about the investigation uh, to law enforcement, but I'd be happy to take your other questions at this time. So again, here's a, a relatively simple statement to the press uh, or that could be used as a, as a press release. For your internal communication, um, again, this needs to be written in the right voice, um, but you could say something for your team along the lines of this. Today we experienced a terrible tragedy that we cannot begin to understand yet. We are all grieving deeply for our fellow employees who were victims of this unthinkable violence. As we begin to process and cope with this experience, I want you to know that there will be grief counselors on site tomorrow from 8 to 5. You can meet with them as a group or privately. I also want to acknowledge that this will impact everyone differently, and I encourage you to take the time that you need to grieve and begin to heal in your own way. More, inf more information will come tomorrow from Human Resources on how we handle this in the days and weeks ahead. But for today, I welcome you to go home, or if you'd like to go and be with your team somewhere off-site, that may be a good idea as well. I'm grateful every day to have all of you on my team and that we get to work together. Today, I'm especially thankful that you are all safe and knowing that we will get through this together. You might be thinking about safety and how we can prevent future incidents like this from occurring. Know that we take this incident seriously and we're working directly with an outside consultant that specializes in security and crisis management to understand how to best protect our team in the future. We'll share more in the coming days. So here you have, I think, a genuine statement from a leader to their team about what has happened. Uh, and again, this needs to be done in the authentic voice of the person that's going to deliver the messages. But we think that this is a, a, a good one, uh, a good model to follow. I want to talk briefly about social media as we start to wrap up here. Your employees are, are probably going to post on social media during a major incident like this. Trying to force them not to post, trying to stop them is pretty futile. Um, it's just as important in our mind that you post factual information on social media uh, as much as you're publishing and editing press releases. You've got to kind of do it in an asynchronous manner. Um, you really have no idea how fast social media is going to fly by in a crisis until you've been in the middle of this. It's going to be completely unmanageable for the most part without a huge team to support you, and most organizations won't have that. So I would use social media to reinforce your messaging as you can. If you ever get the opportunity to do a social media uh, reputation exercise with your communications folks, I would encourage you to do that. Remember that it'll be you here in the middle of this situation and you want to have that communications plan and templates available to make this as easy as possible for you. We do offer a number of free resources around active shooter planning and crisis communications. You can find those on our website at brightpath.com. We have some paid resources uh, like an active shooter 101 ebook that goes further than our free course does. The same for crisis communications, and we do sell uh, pre-written and um, we do sell pre-written actor shooter plans, and, and some of those also come with options for us to help you develop the plan. You can learn more about that at brightpath.com/products, or just go to our main website at brightpath.com, and we'll give you some information there. I'll wrap up by saying um, first by thanking you for coming to the webinar today. Uh, I would also state that if you're looking for help with your active shooter planning and preparedness, uh, mitigation, workplace violence program, crisis management, or any things that we've talked about in the webinar today, I'd love to chat with you about what your opportunities are and how we might be able to help. You can reach me at brian.strauser at brightpath.com or give me a call at 612-235-6435. I'd love to have a great conversation with you. Thanks again for coming. Reach out anytime if you need help.